logistics. Um, so well, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, John, to, I guess, introduce yourself and I guess uh, a little bit more about Career Clinic today. Sure. Yeah. And then I'm looking forward to jumping into the questions too. So my name is John Cutler. I currently work at a company called Amplitude. And so Amplitude focuses on product analytics generally. Um, but my role is pretty unique in that um, I spend most of my time focused externally talking to companies, some that are customers or some that are prospects or just companies um, about topics that surround our product, like things like data informed product or product leadership or how to structure teams. Um, so these are kind of topics adjacent to Amplitude, but that as a company, we generally, we see our product as part of an ecosystem of things. And so to be successful, you kind of need to think about this stuff as well. Um, so one, uh, Fast in my job is I end up meeting lots of teams. So I think last year I did 150 workshops. So maybe 1500 people from 150 different companies. And those were in-person workshops, doing things like North Star workshops, question storming activities, um, thinking about goals, assumptions. That's another activity we do. So it, it gives you a lot of really interesting insight into different teams from around the world. And that's generally what I work on. So my background is in UX and product management. I started in video games um, at a failed video game company where we made a bartending game called Last Call. Um, and if you're a movie fan, the one funny thing is the, the trivia is that uh, Tina Fey, the actress actually uh, under a pseudonym name did a lot of the voiceovers for it, which is really funny. <laughs> So I have these like recordings of Tina Fey as, as a nurse in a bar um, in, in part of the game, which is really funny. Um, but yeah, that failed. And then through different industries, you know, ad tech, uh, then a lot of B2B software as a service companies in the last five to six years, uh, six, six or seven years. And then Amplitude, you know, we're a B2B SaaS company, but then we deal with, you know, you know from, you know, Lego and Ikea down to two people, uh, two-person startups, so a big range of companies. But I think our topic for today, you know, one um, thing that I'm really passionate about is that I think a lot of the dominant product advice comes out of Silicon Valley, uh, and which is good. I mean, maybe we get some perspective into how those companies work. Um, but in meeting people from around the world, uh, you see that not all contexts are the same as those contexts. And people are often thinking about their career um, you know, and they'll go on Twitter and they'll read the, to be a top 1% PM, you know, at this in this company. And they're, they're sort of thinking, well, I don't know, you're not sharing a lot of context about that. <laughs> and so there, and not every environment is, you know, a native digital product company. You know, some companies are, some of Amplitude's most interesting companies are like Anheuser-Busch is a customer of ours and, and they use they're just now building the muscle to think about product when it talks about wholesaling liquor or something, you know, so, or, or medical companies. So some of the most interesting product work is actually happening in non-digital product companies with companies that are building these chops. And so I thought, you know, for today, thinking about career trajectory and career tips, or at least sharing what I've observed would be a good topic um, because not everyone is in those particular environments. Um, that you read a lot about. So I think it's, it's good to kind of spread the, spread the context, if anything. Yeah, awesome. Um, I think that trajectory, I guess, from coming from a design background, it's one that I have myself. So I, I um, studied design at university and I think, you know, sort of my career evolved into UX and then into product management. And, and so I personally get a lot of people asking me, I guess, who come from a design background, um, you know, how do I get transition or get into product management? Um, so I guess, yeah, keen to hear your advice on that transition and what you yeah, think um, will be successful or otherwise. With. <laughs> it's funny because now when I have designer friends say, I, I want to get into product management, I'm going to be completely honest. And the first bit of advice I give them is, are you sure? <laughs> because sometimes what they're saying is, is that our particular company feels like it's a little bit behind the curve from a product perspective. And if, and only if I can somehow get more hands on the reins, I can do the work that I want to do. And I think that's a very noble, you know, it's, the, it's a good idea. It's, it's a noble idea to be able to do it. 
but sometimes I think some people benefit from a little bit of patience there. You know, the organization's coming around and there's a lot of things that you can do as a designer to advocate for sort of more impact focus or, you know, building better products that don't necessarily require being the product manager. So what happens is they get extremely excited that they want to make this transition. They think, now I'll have a seat at the table, you know, now things will work, you know, these PMs apparently, and then they become a PM and they realize, oh my goodness, this is, this is it. Like, this is the calendar that I signed up for. I mean, this is ridiculous. I want to get back to having an impact. So, so I think the first bit of, and this is not to say, I mean, I love product management, you know, with all my heart to say it, but I think the first bit of advice is why, you know, ask yourself why the, maybe it is more money and obviously more money is good, or maybe it's a different career trajectory. Maybe you want more influence, or maybe you've observed that the path to get things to happen in the company is through product management. All of these are great reasons, but I think number one, come to peace with the why you want to do that. And we, yeah, do we have time to continue on this question? Cause I think it's just like, and the, yeah, next step, absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. provided that provided you've come to grips with the why I really would recommend it, that it, that thing that if you can create some working situations with PMs at your, so the question is, do you want to do it within your company or leave your company? If you want to do it within your company, your number one opportunity is to partner very closely with a product manager almost like at, you know, joined at the hip kind of learning from each other. You'll learn from them and they'll absolutely learn from you. And, and then, you know, really see that this is a company you want to be a product manager in. And in, in many ways, the PMs who have transferred internally, or sorry, the designers who have transferred internally from designer to PM, who seem to have been the most successful and done it most successfully, were really, you know, almost had product people kind of looking, almost had a product manager nudge them and say, you know, you should really look into product. You know, they really established themselves and did everything they could as like a senior designer and really showed their product shops and experimented what they were doing. And it's, it was almost like a natural step within their company versus a forced step. Meaning that if you're a junior designer and you kind of like design and you're like, oh, I'm not sure what's going on and you haven't really had a chance to work within your company, your best bet might be to put in a bit more time as a designer, kind of explore what it is, explore the partnership with PM and then make the transition. I think the more interesting one is if you're gonna to try to transfer to the PM role outside your company, so you're eager to leave your company um, and you're gonna do the product role. And what I would try to do in that case is even just for three to six months in your company beforehand, just take a lot more interest in the framing of the outcomes of the work you're doing, what's the product strategy that's involved, You know, really try to become engrossed in part of that to frame a narrative. So that right at the top of your resume, you can sort of list that last bit of work you were doing in detail and really try to highlight the product thinking that you applied in that particular case. So hopefully that helps people. I mean, I think first, really come to peace with why you want to do it. Two, if you're transferring within your company, partner with a PM closely, and then, and then usually that's the best path to do it. And I think finally, if you're looking to just transition by moving out of the company, it's pretty competitive and you're going to need like a good, unless you're going to kind of go all the way back to like a junior PM or associate PM position, you're going to need some chunk of work that speaks pretty clearly to your product skills, um, if that helps. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, I definitely <laughs> had that tap over the shoulder and felt like a fallen into product management um, now <laughs> feeling feeling it with my calendar that's for sure so um yeah definitely and had some really good feedback in the chat there too um so just wanted to I guess bring some australian context so i think product thinking and mature and maturity around product thinking in the australian market i, th I think can be quite hit and miss um mm -hmm. so we do have you know some some i guess more mature um, product companies, digital product companies, but we also have, you know, a huge industry of, of banks, of um, kind of traditional business, retailers, et cetera. Um, and I guess, you know, we hear from a lot of product managers who feel that, you know, they're not really empowered to make the decisions or drive the direction of the product they're working on. And, 
and really they've just kind of given a bit of a top-down directive of of here are the features to build <laughs> and their role is right. really just to deliver them um so I guess for product managers who find themselves in that situation like what can they do um I guess to build their skills and still develop as pr product managers and and also sort of come to peace with where um they can carve where out the a, a career for themselves yeah <laughs> Well, here's, here's my take on it is first is, you know, find the fine line between don't ask for permission, just don't get fired. I mean, you know, so the, the lesson that I learned, and this was about two or three years ago, observing a lot of companies is that first of all, a lot of passionate PMs are leading with the way, not the why. So, you know, they'll go to the business and they'll say, well, why aren't we doing shape up or why aren't we doing this practice or why do we run in a feature factory or, you know, you know, they're talking about techniques or they're talking about, you know, they're sort of, they're not leading with the why for the business. That was funny because I said why, but when I mean why is basically like, how does it matter for the, how does it matter for the business and for the customers out there that these practices could be good candidates to improve business outcomes. And so a great example is a UX researcher. I remember you know, people would say, well, we're gonna do a design sprint right now. We have to do a design sprint. And I always remember the, the business or the PM sort of being like, well, why, you know, so what? <laughs> why, did, you know, but I became really antagonistic. You know, it's like, no, we have to do this in a particular way. So I think that the first thing, if you're in an environment like that, is you have to listen to the investor calls, you have to understand the business, you really need to understand why modern product practices can help. And to give you a very specific example, you know, if at the moment for your particular company, you're in a banking app or something, and there's probably an area of that company where it really would matter, where there's a lot of, you know, user interaction, where there's a lot of potential for experimentation, where there's a lot of where the business is hurting. You know, an example from a bank is a lot of banks have to shift to a younger demographic now. And so they can't just make late fees on their older bankers like they used to. Now, that's a huge shift for that company that's going to involve experimentation. It's going to involve user, re uh, you know, research. It's going to involve mistakes. It's going to involve a bunch of things. So anyway, long story short, number one is first understand the why for the business about how modern product practices could help and start with that why versus the way, you know, why aren't we working like Google or we should do okay. I hear this a lot with OKRs, you know, the, the, the person internally will be extremely passionate about OKRs and I'll say, well, why, why? Why should we worry about OKRs? How is that gonna help the business make more money and make our customers happier? And in many cases, they don't, they can't answer. They say, well, better alignment. Okay, well, why? Or more empowerment. Okay, now you could argue that maybe empowerment will help you retain employees. That's a really, really good reason. You don't want people leaving because they feel disengaged. But what could you do with more empowerment? Well, how could you help the business with more empowerment? So I think number one, think like a business person for a little bit and think like, why is this going to matter for this company? Because you can't waste a lot of, and I see a lot of change agents waste a lot of energy getting angry and getting, you know, they really beat themselves up about everything going on in their company. They're, they're perpetually antagonized and they're not even focusing on their work in many cases. They're, they're bored by their work and they're antagonized and they're really not being effective and they're not helping their own career prospects either. When they look back in two years, they can't list any outcomes they created. Okay, so that's the first thing. This is like the tough love kind of part, right? The second thing I think has to do with doing, in many cases, there's lots of things you can do in product that your company will look at and say, well, that's kind of weird that they're doing that. Oh, okay, sounds okay to me. A good example would be you're told to build feature X. Now you could just go off and build that and stew in your own juices about how bad it was that you were told to build feature X. But a better thing is to actually write a one pager as if you hadn't been told the feature and ask around and frame the business rationale for what you're doing and then take that feature idea and then put it in the lower right-hand corner of the one pager and say options to consider. <laughs> then the next meeting you go to the business person's like, well, how are we doing on the feature? And they say, well, let's look back at the one pager here. Let me just go through this for a second. You know, we're doing this to increase this because the business is doing this. 
And from what I heard from you, what your idea was, was this one thing right now. <laughs> and I guess I'm saying that there's many opportunities to like hack the system that you're in to let, to give yourself the experience of going through the motions. No one will be, no, they'll be confused. You wrote the one pager. Why did they do that extra work to write a one pager for the effort? You're not going to get fired though, because of it. You're not going to say to someone, well, I'm not building that feature. You're saying just for me, I needed to understand the business context more. Therefore I created this thing to do. So anytime, that's just an example, but anytime you can hack the system that you're working in the same, here's another perfect example, learning reviews. Even in feature factories, you will not get fired if two or four weeks after some feature ships, you go in and you review the analytics and you review what happened and said, well, we thought this would happen. And you know what? You told us 50% of everyone would use it, but only 1% are using it now. Like you're not going to get fired for that. And so the, the advice I give anyone is your environment might not be perfect, but that does not stop you from trying to get around the product loop. What was the strategy? Where did you, th why prioritize? What experiment did you try? What was the outcome? And then what did you learn? The number one thing is if you decide to leave that company, you will need that experience to put on your resume for the next company. You'll need to be able to go back in your mind and say, well, over the last two years, there was like 12 major initiatives that we shipped. Here was the hypothesis for each one. You know what? They told me to build feature X. Just put that a little bit to the side and then say, and here's what we thought would happen. Here was our assumptions. Here's what we tried. And here was the outcome. And then here was how we shared the information. That's what will help you get your next job too. But if you sit around for two years saying this place sucks and everything's broken, the problem is when you try to get that next job, all you're going to have to show for it is... Um, you know, I instituted the new agile product practice and now we can define epics or something like that. That will be the top thing of your resume. And that's not going to get you the job you want at the next place. So think to summarize, first, start with the why for the company, not the way you have in mind. Second, think about hacking the existing thing whenever you can, the words you use, the documents you create, almost kind of act the part and, and, and no one's going to really get too mad at you for doing it. Right. And then third, really focus on that learning loop to both build your skills as a PM and set yourself up for a future job. If you so choose to leave that company and you know what, you might do all that and realize that your company is just improving just along at the right point and you love your coworkers and you want to stay there, you know? So yeah, walk the walk. <laughs> And, and good things can happen. Um, yeah, hopefully that helped. Yeah, I think it's great advice. <clears throat> I think when you walk the walk, you attract other people who walk in the same walk as you as well. So I think- um, Show, don't yeah, tell really all the time with this stuff. And, and a lot, I think a lot of people paint these executives you know, in banking or other things as these sort of unfeeling, they just, they don't understand. Well, I'll tell you one thing, they understand business really, really well. <laughs> so there's a lot you can learn from them, that's one. Two, they don't understand potentially what's possible with digital because they haven't built products before. So that's probably their gap in understanding. So your role really there is to empathize with the goals that they need to create. Talk them down a little bit off the ledge with regards to what they think are the solutions. And then you need to lead by painting a vision of what's possible with design and data and technology about how to help them meet their particular goals. If you leave the void there, they're gonna fill the void. So it really is about something you can practice every day. You know, so if you give up, then it, it, I don't think it helps at that, so. Awesome advice, thank you. And Nick, I think you had the next question. Yeah, so this one probably ties us back to the first question where we spoke about uh, UX designers moving into products, probably extending beyond that to people, I guess, other people who are early in their careers and those other roles like, you know, business analysts and the like, mm. um, you know, what, what do you see as the best way for them to gain that necessary experience um, so they can be set up for, for success in their future and product management? So obviously that first question you had before around why do they want to do it, but probably yeah. if they've gotten past that, that first hurdle, how can I set up for success? Yeah, so early, earlier career PMs to set themselves up for the, the future thing is if they've transferred. Um, in yeah, there. yeah. Or well, if they want to go down that path, how do they can really- yeah, yeah, I think that this will sound 
weird, I guess, but it's a little bit related to the second question about how you'll create tempo in your career and kind of the tempo of learning for what you need to do. So um, I have met a lot of junior PMs and, and then you sort of connect with them and you ask them to kind of review the last year or two of their career. And in many cases, you know, they, they've dedicated so much time to just trying to figure out how to do something like write stories or specs. You know, they, they've, they've been so into the kind of nitty gritty of those things that they have a hard time talking about that loop that I was talking about, right? So they, they, so I think that there are some very specific things they can do. First of all, keep your own learning journal about the efforts that you're working on. That's going to help you reflect on past, see how your decision quality and the decision things are working on. I think that that's really, really effective. I think another thing that's extremely important is to build that relationship with like an engineering counterpart and a design counterpart very early and create a little bit, you know, it's called like a trio or something like that, but a little group that you can meet with to at least share your experiences and share what you've learned about that to get the other perspectives of people. I think that that's a very important thing for people to do. Again, you see this problem earlier is that, you know, the junior PM starts and then a year or two later, they can't really empathize with what designers are trying to do. They're so just overwhelmed that they don't pause a little bit to get a sense of what the other parties are doing. I think that's the next thing. The third thing that I would say is goes back to that element of really understanding how the business works and it makes money. Um, often when you start out again, you're so overwhelmed that you don't really become a nerd of the business model that you're working in. It's very distant for you. You know, you're working on this and, oh, you know, I'm the PM of this. Um, so I think that that really helps. But all in all, I think what, you know, to kind of follow on the advice from the second bit of advice, the number one risk for these junior folks is they just get in such a reactive position that they're not really introspective about what they're learning and how they're working and the partnerships that they're creating. The partner thing, this partnership thing especially is incredibly important because if you're going to move from an associate PM to a PM to senior PM, you're never going to do that just on your own steam. You're going to do that because other people in the organization see a spark in your eye and see a spark in what you're doing and are going to sponsor you for each of those particular steps as you're doing. So one of the things you can do very early on is start building those that relationship with those other parties internally, because I think that that's, that's another thing that comes back and bites people is they've done it for two or three years and no one really knows about their work either. Because being a product manager can actually be pretty solitary unless you make that extra effort um, for partnership. No, that's great advice. I mean, I particularly like that um, that learning journal and it's probably something that I never really thought of to now, but I think I can see a, a benefit of that yeah. just continuously in your career, I think even beyond that. that I do think I'm always doing that. I don't, I don't have mine here, but I have it. But, you know, so things, I create little exercises for myself. Mm. Like I make a risk list, you know, and so yep. risk list will be, you know, like what is anything new happen this week that increases the risk that things are going to explode? Yeah. You know, did, is there any, ri and, and so I think that building, um, this goes to that thing of kind of walking the walk where so many of these best practices in product, they seem like good ideas. They're intellectually good ideas. And then you just get caught up in the job. And then three years later, you're wondering like, am I doing it yet? And this is where, you know, blocking out your calendar, setting aside like that Monday morning, deep thought kind of activity. If you don't do that early, your boss will be really surprised when you start doing it. So right from the beginning, <laughs> start carving out that time to do that type of introspection. People sometimes think, oh, I need an hour for it, but really 30 minutes or 20 minutes at the end of the week, just to do a quick wrap up of what you learned and new, new relationships to build and things like that can go a really, really, really long way. Yeah, awesome. Um, so I wanna shift the dial to those senior product managers. Um, how do you, yeah. what do you think senior product managers should focus their development on to make them like a viable candidate for those, those next roles, those head of product roles, those VPs, chiefs, et cetera? Yeah. 
Well, I think that that's, you know, it's right before you mentioned the VP thing, I was like, you have to decide whether you just want to be a brilliant individual contributor PM or whether you want to be a manager of other PMs. Um, and I think that, that that's hard for me to dictate for anyone. Um, one of the big mistakes that I see people make is just assume, this is, this is going to be a little bit of a rant, but I think this has to do with the VPs in general are thinking about product is they do not create a career trajectory for PMs who just want to remain a PM that involves bigger challenges and bigger things. You basically hit a wall as a PM and the only way to continue developing is through a management route um, as you do the particular thing. So I think that this is why a lot of companies lose some of their best PMs because they didn't provide that track <laughs> to continue you know, doing that. Um, so that's, that's number one. So if you want to keep those PMs, you have to think about how to potentially create an environment for people who don't want to become managers of other PMs. The second thing you're going to need to do is you're going to need to find a way to learn that management is not the same as product management. <laughs> So that depends a lot on the culture within the company. Sometimes the culture in the company is the heads and the VPs are really are the most senior PM and they happen to do a little bit of management and coaching on the side. And the environments there are really sort of wild west in terms of career development. And I think that this is a little bit of a sad statement on where PM is at, is that PMs are so expected to be so self-sufficient and so self-running and self-charging and so adaptable that the environments exist where there's no real managing or coaching of PMs. It's pretty much you report to a really, really good PM who's still doing a lot of product management and managing on the side, and then you're doing it. So this is all to say that you might not get the ideal environment in your company for coaching and mentoring. So you'll have to create those opportunities. So if you want to become a good manager of other PMs, you may need to find other managers like engineering managers or design managers or other people to start really building a good relationship to learn about management. Um, so one practical way is you can do a lot more partnering with the engineering manager on your team to kind of learn what management is about and learn what you're doing because you might not get it from your particular boss. And I think that the next thing along with that um, Along that particular, so you're going to need to figure out management. You're going to need to understand the culture in your company, whether the senior product people are expected to still be PMs and stuff too. But I really would start to look at that intersection of business strategy and product strategy, because that is not something that someone will have explained to you yet. This idea that you are the VP is kind of creating that glue strategy that can be almost as easily interpreted as a business strategy, but can easily be a product strategy as well. So you're gonna to need to pay a lot of attention to strategy. And this is again, where it's sort of, you might ask your boss to invite you into more of those particular strategy conversations, but your boss might be so busy that they can't do that. So you'll need to start thinking about becoming a strategy nerd. So I think that that, um, Hopefully that sums that up. I think in general, first decide whether you actually want to become a manager of other PMs, test your org out for the idea of a senior PM track that's not management. And then if you are going to go into management, you my point there largely was you may not be getting the mentorship and coaching you expect from your boss, so you'll need to develop it somehow. So either partner with other managers to learn more about management. And then similarly with strategy, you may or may not get that, but you're going to have to at least up-level the strategy of the product that you do own at the moment to build the chops to that ability, sort of punch up with the strategy that you're doing and see, see how far you get. So hopefully that helps. That really does. That's great advice there. Thank you, John. I'll, be, I'll pass back to Meg. Yeah, I love that thinking around, I guess, practitioner career paths versus management career paths. I think that's, yeah. you know, always, always a conversation, I guess, in the in the tech lead CTO kind of world, but I don't think it's it's a conversation we have enough um, in product. Right. So yeah, appreciate that. I would, I would um, add one thing is there's a lot of creative models now that I see companies doing where, for example, there's more pairing between product people, like more junior and senior. I get back to that whole Wild West problem. I think some product leaders are realizing that. So instead of just throwing the junior PMs onto a team, crossing their fingers, and if they make it through a year or two, then they're good PM material, which frankly, I think is a really privileged, probably biased view that biases product management 
away from certain people. Like it probably means that product isn't as diverse as it could be. But these product leaders are seeing that. And they're doing more like, like pairing of PMs for mentorship. They're doing more rotating PM roles so that you're not stuck with one product that you can learn. They're figuring out like mentorship circles around people of similar, like the design counterpart, the engineering counterpart, et cetera. So if you are a product leader, you know, you're not beholden to that sink or swim approach. There are many different models. I think even, even some are incredible. I think I, I did a presentation for Canva recently and they have a, a late career shifters program where they have a whole education program for people who are skilled at work. You know, like they're, they've worked at work for a while and they're shifting to PM and it's like a boot camp model that people do. So there's so many interesting opportunities if you're a leader to kind of up level your organization. Sorry yeah, to interrupt. That's an awesome thought. No, it's a great thought as well. Um, I know I've definitely benefited from as a consultant having, um, I guess, a little team of product management type people that I've been working with. And I think, you know, right. I think it's beneficial for all of us. Um, awesome. So last question before we take, um, I guess we move to the Q&A from the audience. Um, and this is, again, maybe talking back to some of the uh, previous con conversation. Um, and I guess we're all probably familiar with North, the North Star Metrics playbook. And I guess that um, outcome driven mentality for right. successful products. Um, so I guess for some of those organizations where they might be much more historically focused on financial metrics or delivery metrics, sort of what's your advice to introducing the kind of outcome driven metrics and, and I guess some of the, the things that you um, outline in the North Star metric playbook? Yeah, I mean, I think the clearest way I could describe it is by describing an activity we do in our workshops, and this will make a lot of sense, is that I actually, you know, I'll ask them, well, what are you working on? And then I'll say, okay, well, if you're successful with that, what is it going to increase or decrease? I say, well, if, you know, we're successful with this on, you know, this bank reconciliation flow, it's going to increase, I don't know, or decrease the number of errors or something. And then I go to that and I say, well, well if you're good at that, what is that going to increase or decrease? And we just keep this activity going. <laughs> And it, you know, at the end of the day, you, you end up with these sort of sustainable business outcomes. You know, it might take you three steps, it might take you five steps, but eventually you're gonna get there. So the point that I try to make to folks in more complex environments like banking or things where you're sort of, it feels more distant between your work and these general business outcomes is it's sort of the product manager's responsibility to, tell, to frame a narrative. It's not gonna be one step because there's no possible way that someone will come to work building that and suddenly it's gonna generate a sustainable business outcome. Much more likely you're gonna work on this and it's gonna improve this other thing and it's gonna improve this other thing and it's gonna improve this other thing. And so I think that in general, I have lots of diagrams, I wish I could have shown some, but um, in general, what I've noticed is the business won't really care about this stuff. So they're just focused on the business metrics. And the product strategy probably won't touch on this all too much because they're just sort of in the middle there. So the first thing any PM can do is just frame those, that sort of tree of impacts. Now you could use Teresa Torres's opportunity solution tree. That's really good. You could use the North Star framework. That's really, they're actually all basically the same. They're basically talking about how the things that you are working on right now that you have a meaningful impact on right now will have an impact on something and will impact something and will impact something and will impact something to be lagging metrics. So yeah, without going too deep into it, I think that the number, the number one problem I see in the banks is they say, we're going to be outcome focused. And you know what? They just go from being a feature factory to a short-term outcome factory. All they've done is just, they're, they're not doing better product. They just got so obsessed with OKRs or having things be quantitative that the, they're just tacking these odd goals onto every project that they're being asked to ship anyway. So really at the end of the day, they've just exchanged one form of like outcome, you know, output centricity for another one and then just tack numbers on them to do it. So the number one thing you can do is to start framing that narrative about how the work you're working on now through a series of steps will encourage sustainable growth for the company. I'd be happy to follow up with anyone. You could always email me at john.cutler at amplitude.com. I'll send you some examples of what I mean, but 
that's what anyone can do. If you don't do it, the void will be there and someone will fill it. So you have to, you have to create that narrative. The thing I always say to someone is, could I go to any member of your team, pull a JIRA ticket out of a bucket, and say, can you go from this JIRA ticket to something that will matter to the company in one to three years in more than three steps? I feel that's the product manager's job. <laughs> and if the answer is no, the engineers don't care, or no one really cares, or I don't know, you have work to do. And no one will stop you from doing this. You're just going to have to ask a lot of questions uh, in your company. Yeah, great. It's, uh, it's not an e always an easy path to find all the way up to, I guess, the strategic goals, but- um, It's all a hypothesis. But, yeah. the, the number one problem that companies have is they think that it's a math problem. They think that if they find the perfect metric, it will settle all debates, every meeting will go smoothly, the hippo decision maker will go away, suddenly you'll find the perfect metric and everything will be fine. That is not how it works. In fact, if you use measurement as a trust proxy like that, if you use it as a tie settler, like the idea you're going to find the numbers and just shut everyone up, you're destined to fail. All the numbers are doing are framing your current hypothesis. And so the technique that I use a lot with companies is don't frame this as finding the perfect KPI or the perfect metric. For, map out your beliefs and say, based on what I've heard from everyone's strategy, here is the map. This is our current hypothesis. And when we change what we know, we'll change it. And that is much more effective internally. The minute you say to someone, we've got to find KPIs for this, everyone shuts up. The minute you say, what do we need to learn about this to improve everyone is all ears and is talking. And that's because the minute you connect numbers to performance output and team, judging teams and things, it all kind of falls apart. So yeah, measure with care is usually my, my tip uh, for that. Yeah, great. Okay, we've got time for audience questions. There's quite a few already, um, but if you do want to add one to the Q&A, we'll see if we get time to answer um, your question for John as well. Um, Nick, do you want to kick us off with the first one? Yeah, we'll do. So we've got a question here from Tony. I'll try and summarize. It's basically saying, wondering if you have any tips for managing your workload when you're moving from a senior PM role into a lead or head of product role. So I guess how you're balancing with that transition period where you have you know, on the tools responsibility and then trying to take up that leadership uh, component at the same time. Yeah, it's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a really, really, well, well, one thing, this, this is going to sound, I'm not sure how this will come out, but often in that case, even as a head of product, you have a manager and you're setting expectations with them. And I think that part of this is a little bit about managing up. Like some people get into that head of product role and they sort of, they make all sorts of promises about their time and they're trying to take the weight of the world on top of their shoulders. They're going to fix everything. They're going to be the better manager than, uh, they've never had a manager that good. They're going to try to be the best manager they could ever possibly be. And then they still have their hands in everything. They're trying to do the strategy. They're trying to do all this particular stuff. So I think one of the first things that you can do is almost frame with your manager sort of the North Star for your next quarter and really just try to apply product thinking to how this transition is going. You cannot be successful at everything. And so, for example, I will, I will share this, that when you talk to leaders and they talk about this transition in retrospect, they'll always remark that most of the things that I thought were a problem were not actually the big problem. So I feel that you can almost like shortcut that <laughs> by knowing that that's going to be the case and then sort of trying to set reasonable goals with your manager. So for example, like in that first quarter, it's, you know, look, if I can even just get my cadence of meetings going with the PMs that are doing this and we've got that, that would be a huge win. That's my win for, the, you know, that's my operational win for this quarter. If the next quarter, you know, if the only thing that we get right <laughs> is that we have a couple of like, we get a learning review going and we get our metrics picture straightened out, that would be great. So yeah, Tony, like I think it's basically whenever I talk to a product leader and they look back on this, they say they, oh, they tried to overdo it to the T. And so just try to shortcut the urge to overdo it and, and treat your own development as a product. Like what is the North Star of your thing? Like what, what, what do you know you need to get right um, as you go? So ho hopefully that, 
I'm just sharing the experience that everyone looks back and they realize they tried too much, basically. That's me too. Like every, everyone does that. <laughs> Great. Um, so next question we have here from Dana. Uh, what advice do you have to build your product management skills when your day job is, for example, like project management, portfolio management? Yeah, this is, this is really good. I think, you know, I'll just use a simple example, like a one pager or some, I, I'm, I'm not really big on product requirements documents, but when I say a one pager, I talk about like an outline of the assumptions, the outcomes. I use a system called like drivers, constraints, and floats, like what's driving the effort, what are the constraints, which is actually Dana should realize this because it's similar to the project management triangle, but it's a little different, you know, like with product, we think about what's driving the effort, what's constraining it, and what areas of flexibility we have. But I would think that the first, so that's one is sort of like, can you introduce the, ha can you start building the habits that you need? So in addition to the kind of the projects you're working on, could you frame these things as more of a product initiative versus a project? What outcomes are you looking at? What are areas of risk? So that could be one thing. I think that another thing is talking to customers whenever you can. <laughs> one thing is, and, and, Doing so in a way which is targeted more at learning than versus maybe if they're internal stakeholders, you're talking to them about, you know, what they need out of the effort. So can you start building a little bit of a discovery muscle? I'm trying to think for Dana things that would not keep her up at 11 p.m. at night. I mean, obviously, you could sit there and try to take courses and things, but what are things you can do in the run of the day? And so that would be like adjusting your artifacts to be a little bit more product centric. And then to being getting the muscle going for interacting with um, customers. And then back to that trio idea, you know, spending a lot more time to understand the thought process of the designers and the engineers and folks that you're working with to kind of learn that kind of, that partnership angle. At a really simple level, Dana, it could also be like when you get into those meetings and you're going to like orange, green, and red, or you're back in the project world you could just try to hack it slightly and it might annoy people where you're just like, well, the delivery of the project is orange, green, and red, but the outcome of the project is currently question mark. <laughs> like you could just hack the system a little bit, Dana, and just, because you're gonna need to do that when you're a PM anyway. There's gonna be all sorts of situations where you're, where you're just asked to go through the motions and you have to figure out how to interject why you're doing this, like why the project is running or why the program is running. So yeah, I think, um, <laughs> Don't stay up till 11 and especially I have kids. I mean, we can't work that hard, but try to hack those little things um, could be valuable. Cool. The next question is from Anonymous and I think it probably ties into the last part you said there around staying up to 11. But I guess basically, <laughs> um, you know, as a PM being at intersection of, well, everything, there's a lot of pressure, a lot of stress on you. Any tips on how to like, I guess, manage your, your health and how you handle that kind of, Oh, geez. Pressure. Yeah. The health. And I mean, the last two years, especially, I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. I mean, things are maxed and then normally PMs are just maxed as it is. Huh? Yeah. I think this goes a little bit back to the why you're doing it. I think that a lot of PMs get disconnected with their personal why. And I, this happened to me too at one point. Like I, I played music, I played in bands. And now that I think about it as a PM, I just like being with a group of like fun, creative people making something. Like that was kind of my why. I didn't want to sit in, I didn't, I, it wasn't about like necessarily about status or increasing influence in the company. And I like startups and I like being successful, but I wasn't, you know, like always thinking about the biggest growth hack or things like that. So like part of it, I think is coming back to the why that you're doing it for that person. And the same thing comes with the systems thinking in the change agency. You know, some, I, I learned for myself that I was working through a lot of, you know, childhood shit, <laughs> trying to change my company. You know, I, I wanted it to work differently. I want it to be more healthy. So I think that when you come to the why about why you're doing it, then you can focus your energy into the activities that lift you up versus that bring you down. And so this is specifically to the change management stuff. I mean, I meet these PMs who like their night job is sitting on Twitter talking to me about how they're trying to change their company. And their day job is being a PM. And I feel for you because I'm also up at late night at Twitter. So maybe that's an example, but on the same token, you're never going to have anything left at that point. So it might be like, you know, 
I want to get a new job in two years because this place isn't, I'm not going to, we have a lot more leverage locally than we think, but we have a lot less leverage globally in our companies than we think, I think. And so a lot of people get thrown into trying to change the whole company and they ignore the things they can do in their immediate surroundings to make it more healthy. So I've given you a couple ideas there too, but get really serious with what you like about product and then realize that like, you're not, you have a lot more control over what's immediately around you. And can you make that fun for you? I feel that PMs aren't having enough fun. I mean, it's the pandemic stuff, but part of being a PM is fun. It's like working with creative people, doing creative things and creating outcomes for the business and seeing what will happen. Like we're going to ship this and what will happen. And a lot of people get sucked into, oh, we got to be like Marty Kagan or we got to empower, you know, it's just like this. They're taking on the weight of the world as change agents in their company and they've lost the fun of it. So I don't know. Yeah, sorry, too, too personal, too deep. But yeah, have, get back to having fun and things will that, work out. I think that resonates the most, having having fun in what you do, I think is really important. Um, look, I think we've got time for two more questions. So apologize to everyone whose questions we don't get to, um, but I'll just ask two more and we'll and we'll go from there. So another one from Dana, which I think is quite, quite relevant for a lot of people. How can you apply product management thinking if you support a platform or an infrastructure team? Oh, I love it. And I think this is like the future of digital. It, like this is, first of all, it's harder. So don't let anyone tell you otherwise, but like being a platform product manager, or whatever is actually really hard. I mean, I was like Zendesk and tried to do search. Oh my God, it was like the hardest thing it done. I, I only lasted a year there. It was like so difficult to do it. So I think that the first thing is because you need to think about like the evolution of the platforms. You need to think almost everything you create is going to be used by more than one person. You have all sorts of like economies of scale assumptions around what you're doing. And th those can be mismatched around what you're doing. So I think, yeah, very simply for Dana, um, number one, I believe that your internal people you work with internally are partners. And I like to think the customers out in the world as a sacred idea. So first of all, in product thinking, you can call your internal customers, your partners and users and people who you're working with, but always try to remember and be able to trace how the platforms you're working on are helping the humans out in the world. Because there's many ways to actually make internal stakeholders really happy, but not have any influence out to the people in the world. So the then I, maybe we'll move on to the next question, but at its simplest, I think from a platform thing, you just have to juggle more in your head. One thing that often gets lost is how, how is the work you're doing actually really benefiting the business and the customers out in the world? Are the people who are your internal partners going on to do amazing things for your customers? It's one hop removed that your customer facing PMs don't have to worry about. So you have to fit it all in your head. But if you do that, I think it can make you more successful as a, you know, a platform PM. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I think the last question we'll cover here is from Atpal. It was, I have worked in different areas, marketing, strategy, analytics, engineering, data analyst, product implementation, all in separate jobs. So how do you bring together that wealth of uh, different experiences into one product role? Hmm. So I think I, I'll just, I'm going to mention this in one way. I've found people who really have fallen in love with a domain in their career and they'd really benefit from getting a job that was in that domain. So if, for example, you're really into analytics or really you got really into marketing, it might benefit you to just immediately leverage that by just explicitly looking at you know, gigs that involve one part of that particular domain. And I think sometimes people say, well, if you're a great PM, you should just be able to go anywhere. Everything's gonna be fine. But back to that having fun and integrating what you're doing, if one of those different areas of experience give you a lot of subject matter expertise, you know, you could consider, you know, seeking out jobs that find that one bit of domain. I think that that's one potential idea. The other thing too, is that I mean, you could do, you could do product ops. No, I didn't say that. Like you, you, sometimes I think that 
having so many bits of experience almost gets in your way as a PM <laughs> because you're going to want to be fixing everyone's problem, right? You're going to want to be fixing how engineers are doing it and how the analysts are coming up. The, the data stuff is a really nice overlap. I wouldn't worry too much about that. But I think you want to find a company, this will sound weird, but if you have a background in engineering and these other things, make sure the company you join has really good engineering chops so they will not need your help. <laughs> because if you go in with all this experience and then you go to a company where everything is kind of broken, you're going to naturally get pulled in a million different directions. So I think it would be a real, it would be really, it would be really good for you to find a company that focused on one of your areas of expertise that you really enjoy and wasn't broken in the ways that you would immediately fix it. Otherwise you would be up at 11 PM at night, every night too. So yeah, hopefully that's helpful. No, it's really yeah. good. Thank you, John. <laughs> so we're nearly out of time. Um, actual hours whiz past, but I'd have to say it's been yeah. probably the most valuable hour of my week so far. Um, <laughs> I guess just before we sign off, um, any final thoughts, I guess, on um, PMs in the Melbourne community or broader? Um, and yeah, I guess, yeah, any thoughts from you, John, before we, we finish off? Yeah, I, I would just note this, that it might not happen in the amount of time that works for you, but but the companies are coming around and there's a really, really amazing opportunities that are emerging in companies. You know, like I was on with this like amazing plumbing supply company just yesterday or two days ago, like that blew my mind. I think they might, they might be in Australia, right? I think that and I know the one you're talking about, yeah. <laughs> there's a quote from someone at that particular company and they said, you know, i I didn't expect it, but now I found my people. Like I've never been in a place where people were more passionate about product and more passionate. You know, I feel like more like this is more of a startup than the startup I was in. So I'll leave folks with that particular thinking that, you know, if you found a good group of people and leadership that at least can sort of see the trajectory that things are going. I wouldn't feel this incredible like FOMO about Silicon Valley. I mean, these places are completely dysfunctional in different ways too. So if you find a good group of people that you enjoy being with in a company that has a vision for how this stuff will emerge over time and good leaders in it, you know, you might consider sticking it out is, is, is what I would leave for folks. Like things just don't happen on the one year, two year scale, but like in the three, four, five year scale, like I'm really watching companies improve year after year that I check back on, you know? So it's something to think about if you're sort of frustrated about where things are at at the moment. Awesome. I think that's a great note to finish on. Um, some optimism yeah. for all of us. So appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. I know that we're all really busy and lunch times are often yeah. things that get booked over by others. So um, appreciate everyone coming. Um, it's been a really great discussion and we'll share this recording uh, on the Meetup Group channel. Um, so well, yeah, take some care awesome of yourself. Comments everyone and... take care of themselves. That's the main thing. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for your time and appreciate you joining us in your evening. Um, sure. And yeah, love everything you had to say. It's, it's really great to get the pep talk we all need. Cool. All Thanks right. Everyone. Have a good one, everyone. Awesome. Talk to you all soon. Great. Bye. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.